Admiral Schultz, welcome to the program. Thank you, Mimi. It's good to be here with you. Okay, so the Coast Guard has a unique um, set of um, capabilities, authorities. What is it that you guys do around the globe? Yeah, Mimi, I, I think you sort of got to look at home and away game. And I think home game here, you know, in the in the homeland, we uh, rescue mariners in distress. We enable about $5.6 trillion of annual economic activity through 360 seaports, through uh, 25,000 miles of navigable waterways. You know, on a more global scale, we're doing counter narcotics work off of uh, South America, Central America. We've got ships on a more frequent basis deployed in support of the Indo-Pacific Commander's Theater of Operations, the Seventh Fleet. We're in the high latitudes, the uh, Polar Security Cutter, not Polar Security Cutter, but the uh, Polar Star, our one heavy icebreaker, arrived at McMurdo Station in, in Antarctica yesterday. So they're down there, they broke about 40 miles of ice to get there. They're allowing the uh, replenishment ship with cargo. They're allowing the fueling ship to get in there to allow the important science work that the National Science Foundation does. We're off the African continent. Um, we've got men and women about 300 strong that stand to watch in the fifth lead in Manama, Bahrain on the Arabian Gulf. So we're very much a global Coast Guard and there's a lot of homework, you know, homeland work here. Well, there's a lot there. A lot there. Let's talk right. about the Indo-Pacific. Okay. How are you supporting the Navy in areas around China and Taiwan? So there's there's episodic work where we sail maybe a national security cutter, the Cutter Monroe, which bases out of Alameda, California, returned here weeks back um, from a 102-day patrol. So she was there, she did a Taiwan Strait freedom of navigation transit with a with a combatant from the United States Navy. They did a reciprocal 180 degree out course. We did partner capacity building with the Philippines, Malaysians, Indonesians. So we do a lot of, when you look at maritime forces, a lot of um, naval force around the world look more like the Coast Guard than the United States Navy from a size, from a capability standpoint. We exercise a new memorandum of agreement with Taiwan that was penned in March here by, by our service and the Taiwan East Coast Guard. Um, when you sort of roll it beyond the cutter presence, we've got um, liaisons, we're putting a new attache in Singapore this summer. I've got a Coast Guard commander that's with the Philippines. Philippines is building out their Coast Guard. There's about 3,500 strong, uh, you know, a dozen or so years ago. They're marching now, there's a recent report on MSN that talked about them going towards 75,000. They talked about a 35,000 person Coast Guard. So we are building out them. We work with the Japanese. We bring, we do about 240 mobile training team deployments in about a five-year period. So we, we train thousands of, of partners in their home regions. Then we bring, you know, 1,000, 1,500 students from uh, international maritime services here to our schoolhouses. So there's a lot of stuff beyond just cutter deployments where we, we exchange humans, we exchange training, we share doctrine. There's a lot of different levels that international play works out in the Seventh Fleet. You're also modernizing. So you're modernizing ships, you're modernizing systems. Tell me about the shipbuilding. Is it keeping up with the needs that you have? Well, that's a great question, Mimi. I tell you, it's the most prolific shipbuilding period since the Second World War. Um, that said, you know, we're, we're building offshore patrol cutters. The first one's about 60% complete. That's gonna be a fleet of 25 ships in what we call the program of record, but that's replacing ships that are already 52, 53 years old on the oldest end of that. And they'll be almost 60 years before we get through that, you know, that 25 ship program record. So we're probably a little bit behind need, but I think there's a lot of goodness going on. We've uh, accepted the ninth of a, of, a, of a program that's gonna be 11 national security cutters. The 10th and 11 are under construction down in Pascagoula, Mississippi. We're um, working with VT Halter in Pascagoula that's building the first heavy icebreakers the nation's constructed in more than four decades, what we call the Polar Security Fleet. We're a program record of three ships. I think there's a conversation beyond three. We've uh, just accepted the 47th fast response cutter down in Key West that's being built at, uh, at what we call Bollinger Shipyard in Lockport, Louisiana. That's a program record of 64 ships, six overseas going to stand to watch in Manama, Bahrain on the Arabian Gulf, 58 domestically. So a lot of good activity going on with our shipbuilding programs. We're going to do a, a contract award here in the spring for what we call the waterways commerce cutters. Those are the ships that enable the activity on the nation's rivers and uh, various ports. That's, those are replacing ships. The oldest in athletes, 75 years old. And it'll be almost 80 years old before those ships come in place. So that's going to be a program of about 30 ships, three different derivatives. So a lot going on. And uh, yeah, are we a little behind? But I would tell you now we're on a sort of a steady pace. Um, the administration passed, the current administration, the Congress seems to be uh, recognizing the urgency of this for the Coast Guard. And we, I think we're in a, good, in a good trajectory. You've also got a fleet of aircraft. Correct. What do you use them for and how is that modernization going? So we've got a fleet of uh, 148 
rotor wing aircraft, about 47, what we call uh, Jayhawk MH-60 Sikorsky airframes. Those are our bigger aircraft, a little more capable, five, six hour profile. We've got a fleet of 98 Airbus um, Aerospatial Dolphins um, composite aircraft. So they are they are rescue work. We deploy them on the cutters. So some of the dolphins ride on the back of national security cutter, medium endurance cutters, high endurance cutters. They shoot out engines on drug smugglers down uh, off the north coast of South America and the Eastern Pacific Ocean. Um, we use those for uh, surveillance type work. You know, when you look at a Hurricane Harvey down in Houston back in 2017, you know, there's an air station in Houston that has three dolphin helicopters. When we rescued about 11,000 people from the streets of Houston over about a 48, 96 hour period of time, we had 48 helicopters flying almost around the clock down there. So we can surge them in from all over, we can surge crews in, and then we got a fixed wing fleet. We got a fleet of uh, C-130 J's and H's. We're, we're getting rid of the H's, they're the older model. We're the 19th J's in the 22 budget. That's before Congress right now. We're building out a program at 22 there. Um, we fly these 235 Casas, um, aircraft. It's a Spanish-made aircraft. It's a little, little lower-tech twin-engine plane. And we do a lot of surveillance work. We fly those out of Cape Cod, out of Miami, out of Corpus Christi, Texas. And then we have a fleet of 14 C1, C-27Js. That used to be Air Force. Um, that transferred over to us. We did a little exchange of some of our old airplanes with the fire service, with some support from Congress. 14 of those ended up in our lap. So, Admiral, part of modernization yeah. is your talent needs. You're right. going to need to recruit people, right. you're going to need to train people, you're going to need to retain those trained Absolutely. people. How are you doing on that? So I would tell you, Mimi, you know, when you look across America, there's about less than 25% of American youth have uh, have the eligibility to serve for whatever criteria. Then you sort of look at the propensity to serve. That's been declining in recent years. It's probably, you know, 9 to 11% in there. So we're going after that same you know, shot group of folks at the uh, DOD armed services are, whether it's Space Force, Air Force, Marines, Navy, Army. Um, it's a competitive place. We need to put more mobility in our people's hands. These young Americans that do choose to serve, they're the brightest, you know, young Americans I've had the privilege of serving almost four decades, but they got a lot of choices. And, um, you know, when I came in, it was a defined benefit, two and a half percent. If you made it to 20, you got 50 percent, you retired. These young men and women that come in after 1 January 2018, it's now thrift savings you pay yourself you know at 12 years if you decide we offer you a couple months to stay so it's a whole different set of criteria so we have 90 percent retention the coast guard highest of any armed forces but we need people to be 15 20 30 35 year coast guard what's your pitch i mean what do you say to a young person i mean you know who might want to join the space force i mean that's pretty cool well i'll tell you what what i think we say is we sort of let our brand speak for itself you know if you can get a a young American who's interested in the services out to visit a Coast Guard unit. And our best recruiters are our frontline men and women that do the mission. You know, when you get talk to a, a young 21 year old uh, woman who's driving a you know, multi-million dollar platform and she's in charge of it and she's got a crew of folks and she's out there rescuing people or doing exciting law enforcement work or environmental work. I think when, you know, a young American gets a chance to talk to that Coast Guardsman, they say, I want to be on that team. And you know, and we, we don't train to fight when something comes up when we train to operate every single day. So our missions are 365s, you know, uh, 52 weeks a year. And I think that's the part of the brand that's attractive, but you got to spend some money and you got to be in different cities. We made some reductions in recruiting years back. So we got to put some more recruiters out there because it is competitive. We got to spend a little money in terms of bonuses and things. And uh, for us, our pockets sometimes aren't as deep as our DOD counterparts. So we really got to press in on uh, going to find those. Once we find them, there's a high propensity to stay. You've been commandant since 2018. Correct, one June 2018, yep. What are you most proud of? You know, um, boy, it's been a, when, when I reflect on the last, you know, three and a half years, a lot's happened. You know, we've, we've been in this almost 24 month pandemic cycle and Coast Guard work did not diminish one bit. Matter of fact, we were sending national security cutters, medium endurance cutters off the coast of Columbia doing uh, counter narcotics work. We were rescuing folks, you know, uh, the economy when, when there was, uh, you know, the pandemic sort of hit the cruise industry, you know, there was thousands of passengers, crews at sea. Some of the land site facilities were worried about bringing them in, filling up their hospitals. Every one of those was a, was a diplomatic 
you know, local involvement of uh, port authorities, of hospital officials, of government officials. I'll tell you, I, I think I'm most proud of the resilience of our people. And I think Coasties come with a bias for action. You know, they just put me in coach and uh, you get out of the way, you give them the resources, they get it done. But it has not been an easy time to be a man or woman uniform. If you're on a ship these days, you know, one of the benefits, accoutrements of going to sea was seeing the world. Now you pull into a port, you get fuel, you get groceries. You might get a little liberty on the pier. We maybe sign a memo where you can crack a beer or two and you know sit around and tell some sea stories, but they're not getting to go out to Monte Picchu and trek around Peru. They're sort of been constrained. So I'm hoping that opens up again because I think that's the, the benefits of going to sea, you know? You're one of the speakers at this conference. Correct. What are you trying to accomplish while you're here? So I spoke earlier today and I spoke a little bit about from the commandant's perspective of the Coast Guard. I think it's an era of Coast Guards. You know, a lot of the navies and coast guards of the world are, are much smaller than the united states navy i think we play a, a niche role where we can come in and, and build capacity i think we have a certain brand that connotates you know maritime governance we we adhere to the rules-based order when you see a coast guard cutter white hull orange and blue stripe most of the coast guards of the world mimic us but i think what we do is we we walk the talk too. You know, some Coast Guards are being used aggressively to chase folks off of disputed spaces. The United States Coast Guard doesn't just bring a reputation, we bring the behaviors that go with that. And I think uh, what I tried to talk about was how we are positioning the service to be most useful to the nation as sort of a unique instrument in national security on that genre. We got our domestic home business I talked about, homeland work, but it's how do I put as much Coast Guard in the fight, whether it's off the African continent where food sustainment, illegal fishing's happening by you know other nations that are sort of violating. How do we build capacity? Many nations, you know, just aren't necessarily looking to have big deployable navies, but they want to protect their economic interests, their environmental interests, their safety of their people, their security. That that looks like Coast Guard work to me. All right, well, Admiral, thanks so much. Thank nice you, talking Mimi. to you. Yeah, great to talk to you. Thank you very much. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss out on any future Government Matters interviews.